Hello, students in silviculture class. I'm Matt Russell. I work at the University of Minnesota Department of Forest Resources. My talk is on what I call bugs and forest management. Uh, this is really about how we integrate forest health with silviculture. So I'll talk about some strategies that are used for monitoring and assessing forest health. And then I'll kind of link that into silviculture and how we can use silviculture to uh, better forest health. And then I wanna talk about a specific example, a specific case study with spruce budworm, a insect that's a big problem in a lot of Minnesota's forests. Now I want you to stop and think, what adjectives describe a healthy forest? Think about that for about 10 seconds. Now, many of you might have said something like diverse or productive. Those are good adjectives that describe what a healthy forest is. So it's important to recognize that one person's definition of a healthy forest isn't necessarily another person's. And when it comes to silviculture, how we define forest health is really important. And I like to include forest health in my description of what silviculture is. Uh, and that's really important as we think about how do we maintain, how do we do forest management that promotes healthy forests. And so I wanna talk about how we assess and how we understand how healthy our forests are. Well, one way is to look at the health of the forest at the landscape scale. And so one way to do this is aerial forest health surveys. And so believe it or not, there are people that fly airplanes uh, that look down onto the forest and describe how healthy they are. This is really common. A lot of states do this. This work is organized uh, kind of collectively by the US Forest Service, but then each state is kind of uh, given budgets to kind of implement it in their state. And so as an example, the Minnesota DNR works with the US Forest Service to map areas uh, that, are, that have different forest health problems. And all of that is uh, taken by doing aerially by flying in airplanes, kind of low to the ground. Another way is through National Forest Inventory Information. And so any of you that have heard of FIA or Forest Inventory and Analysis, that's a great program that assesses the status and trends and the health of our forests. And so in that program, they measure permanent sample plots through time and measure things like how the diameters of trees are changing, how the, the, the status of them changes, whether they're alive, whether they're dead, what kind of disturbances have happened. It's a great source of data to understand at the landscape scale, how healthy our forests are. We also can look at the stand scale and measure things related to the health of the forest. And so in the US Forest Service in that FIA program, they have a lot of measurements, what they called uh, the forest health indicators. And so a lot of them are things like downed woody debris. And so obviously downed woody debris is good for things like wildlife and other critters to reside in for habitat, but also too much downwoody debris might be a fire hazard in some ecosystems. And so they measure things like vegetation diversity too. And so an example being uh, measuring understory vegetation in plots to get a sense of how abundant uh, and how diverse the understory is. They'll also measure things like structural diversity, like the heights of various trees in the forest. And then of course they measure things like tree growth. Uh, and so we might consider a productive forest to be a healthy forest. And so at the stand scale, we can collect measurements that say something about the health of the forest. We can look at an individual tree and look at how healthy it is. And so one of the best indicators of a tree's health is to look at its crown uh, and especially its crown index or its crown ratio. And so the tree crowns have been described as the universal index of tree health. And I really like that that term and that definition. For many species, you can look at things like the, um, the crown ratio. If it's between 0.4 and 0.7, well, we might think that's an open grown tree. That might be like my yard tree. If it's between 0.3 and 0.4, we think that that's pretty optimum growth. Uh, and so the tree is not necessarily open grown. It's competing somewhat for light with other trees. If the crown ratio is between 0.15 and 0.3, we think there's severe competition. If it's less than 0.15, well, we know that that tree is probably not going to be able to hold on for very much longer. The crown ratio is not very high. It's not a very vigorous tree. It's probably not going to grow very much. 
And so thinking about landscape, stand, and individual tree level factors and how we might measure them to assess forest health, we can also think about silviculture strategies for forest insects. This is a great paper by Waring and O'Hara that talks about the strategies that we might use for this. The first thing is what can we do before any insect comes? What is the pre-invasion prevention that is? Well, in that case, we can just manage for vigorous trees. We can be doing good forest management that manages for healthy trees and broad genetics. Well, if by chance the forest insect becomes to, comes to an area, well, it arrives, it might then get established and then it might spread. Well, if it arrives, we can think about eradicating it or maybe using some kind of chemical or biological control. If it establishes in an area, we can still think about trying to eradicate it using chemical or biological control, but we can also think about stand manipulation. Maybe we can think about thinning, say as one example. And then if it begins to spread, we can think about what kinds of chemical and biological control might we do? And then what kind of stand manipulation might we do? Uh, in the case of it starting to spread very vigorously, uh, maybe we might be thinking about something like a salvage harvest. And so if it's considered and it begins to spread, we might consider it low endemic if we're able to use silviculture to manage it. And in that case, maybe it's a native insect. And so maybe it's something that we already have some experience working with. On the other hand, if it's high endemic, maybe we can think about trying to manipulate the stand. Maybe we can think about trying to do tree breeding programs. And maybe we can begin to think about even harvesting, maybe again, a salvage operation or something. A good example of a low endemic insect in Minnesota is the spruce budworm. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. An example of a high endemic situation in Minnesota might be the emerald ash borer. In that case, we know that trees are not very resistant at all to EAB. And so we might be thinking about more, more serious ramifications if we're, thought, if we're talking about a high endemic situation. So let's talk more about the arrival phase. This is a fun cartoon I like to show uh, that talks about the emerald ash borer and how it reminds campers uh, not to move their firewood. Well, this is in the first stage of invasion. And so usually when things like this happen, there are lots of quarantines and there are even regulations uh, that try to limit the movement of wood. And the idea about limiting the movement of wood is we don't want infest, infected wood in one area to be moved to another area that's, that doesn't have the insect. And so as an example, pretty much every county in Minnesota that has emerald ash borer is quarantined. That is to say, you cannot move ash wood from that county to another county that doesn't have the insect or doesn't have a known population of that insect. Uh, and that's a way to prevent the insect from spreading. Well, there's also silvicultural actions um, or management actions. So an example of this is the city of Minneapolis and their approach to emerald ash borer. They're basically trying to get rid of every ash tree that they can uh, and trying to plant more diverse species uh, so that they don't have thousands and tens of thousands of ash trees uh, dead at one moment. Another way might be thinking about insecticides for spruce budworm control. This would be an example of a chemical or a biological agent to control the spread of an insect. This map shows the number of non-native forest pests in every county in the United States. And this was uh, about eight years old now. So this was major, made in 2012. And so you can see here, the bluer areas indicate the larger number of pests per county uh, compared to the yellower areas or the um, a lower number of pests per county. And what's the first thing you should notice about this map? So many of these non-native forest pests come in through our major ports. And so if you look at the Northeast where there's a lot of shipping, a lot of trade going on with other countries, even if you look at the West Coast or a lot of shipping with other countries goes on, even in the Lake States, um, lots of shipping going on. So this is a good map that shows uh, really how connected our world is uh, in that uh, sure if you're in maybe many of the Plain States or in the Rocky Mountains, you maybe do not have as many non-native forest pests uh, and that's maybe because the shipping uh, has a, isn't as plentiful in your area as it might be in others. 
Well, what about the establishment phase? Um, and so this means that, well, something might come, uh, say you have a new insect that comes to an area, but there might be a lag time between when it arrives and when it rapidly increases in population. And that duration of lag time can be really difficult to predict. Uh, and so something might arrive, but it might not, you might not see symptoms on trees until even five or 10 years later. And so some silviculture actions we could take are to eradicate the, uh, the pest, to use chemical biological control, or to think about manipulating the stand. In this case, this is a unthin spruce budworm pl plantation, and this is a thin spruce budworm or thin white spruce plantation. And so you can see the differences there. Maybe we'll think about using silviculture to limit the establishment of an insect. The third phase is the spread phase. This is where we start to notice things. This is where uh, for myself and those of us that work in extension, we start to get calls from homeowner, homeowners, calls from landowners asking about what the problems are that they're seeing in their trees and in their forests. And so silviculture strategies might include, again, chemical control. Uh, that's what we're doing here in this photo from uh, of the last big spruce budworm outbreak in Maine in the early 1980s, uh, spraying chemicals aerially uh, across uh, vast forest lands. We might think about a low endemic situation. We could think about intermediate treatments like thinning, and we can consider the pest as native. High endemic situations might be thinking more things like salvage harvesting, and maybe some kind of stand manipulation of some sort. So I want to talk a little bit about the eastern spruce budworm and what that means for our forest. Now the spruce budworm is a native insect that evolved with our forest. Um, it does a lot of damage, but it's actually native and has been here for centuries. So the larvae emerge before bud break in the spring. Uh, they look just like this here. The outer branch shoots and the upper crowns of trees is when you first notice them. They'll form silk webs on the buds and on last year's needles. And then they'll begin feeding on new foliage in the summertime. I've heard from foresters that are working in the woods during this time of year, and they can actually hear the budworms chewing away at the foliage. They're so loud and vigorous. And so they eventually will emerge as moths in mid-July. Uh, and those moths can travel over large very large distances. And a lot of that depends on wind speeds too and certain wind events that can really move uh, budworm across the landscape. So here's where the spruce budworm damage occurred last year. And so this is a graph from the Minnesota DNR's forest health report, their annual report they put out last year. Uh, and you can see most of the damage of spruce budworm is in the arrowhead. And so this is St. Louis and um, Lake counties here. And so lots of damage going on here in this area of the state. So budworm is really important for us to understand because we have about 175,000 acres of white spruce plantations across the region. Now those are kind of the more of the heavily intensively managed plantations, but white spruce is an abundant species in lots of different forest types. It's, inter it's interesting, there, it's rare that you'll find white spruce naturally grown in kind of pure white spruce, naturally regenerated stands. But white spruce grows with so many other different species like aspen, even pine. Uh, it's just a really diverse species and often is found in a lot of different stands. But for these plantations, they're typically managed on a 60 to 80 year rotation. And typically silviculturists will prescribe a mid rotation thinning. Uh, and so going in say at 30 or 40 years to prescribe a thinning. So here's a table of the species susceptibility of spruce budworm. So balsam fir and white spruce are the primary species that are impacted by spruce budworm. This is why I always have a gripe with the entomologist that named this the spruce budworm, because they really ought to have named it the fir budworm. Uh, and that's because balsam fir is more susceptible to budworm than is white spruce. And so with balsam fir, you can get top kill within two to three years mortality within three to four years, uh, and it can't really survive very well if it's been attacked by spruce budworm across multiple years. White spruce, on the other hand, can actually survive uh, many budworm outbreaks. Uh, if you see top kill, it'll be three to five years, mortality in five to seven years, uh, and it has a pretty, uh, pretty moderate susceptibility 
to uh, the bud worm. So one thing that um, many of us at the University of Minnesota did uh, a few years ago was to ask forest resource managers how they're managing different forest pests. Um, and so these are some highlights from that study that we looked at uh, surveying the silviculturists and forest managers that are managing Minnesota forest lands. We found that 10% uh, of forest managers say that spruce budworm is their biggest forest health threat. Uh, and so this was even kind of listed behind uh, some of the things like emerald ash borer. Um, but 10% of all the forest managers said it's their biggest threat. About a third of them said that they use salvage harvesting in areas affected by spruce budworm. And then 7% of them said they use thinning in budworm affected stands. Um, and so just some uh, kind of a pulse about what forest managers are doing related to spruce budworm. Well, to get back to the point of why might we think about thinning as a mechanism to maintain trees and forests that are healthy. Now, well, we know that thinning can maintain vigor. Uh, so vigors uh, and stands will lose vigor as they age. Um, and so the objective here, again, going back to crown ratio being such an important aspect of the health of a tree, the objective here should really be increasing the crown ratios of conifers, particularly the spruce. And the idea here is that if we can maintain vigorous trees and vigorous productive plantations and forests, we can capture mortality losses that we might otherwise see due to budworm. So really young stands, pre-commercial thinning can be an option in spruce and fir. And so you can pre-commercially thin if the stem density is very high. Uh, and so this is really good for younger stands where you have like more than 800 trees per acre. And so you can see this person is going in here with a weed whip uh, with a rotated uh, blade on it uh, and cutting around uh, some of the smaller diameter fir trees. So you can think about trying to remove about 50% of the stems and then keeping those trees with healthy live crowns. So this would be done at an earlier age, uh, say ages um, before age 20, for sure. You could also use thinning. Uh, and then we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about a, um, a thinning study that we conducted with the Minnesota DNR and some others uh, at various locations across the state. And so we have these 10 locations across the state where we thinned one portion of a white spruce plantation and then left the other portion unthinned. And so the idea was that the spruce budworm was coming through these areas. We wanted to see what is the impact of thinning and what does that have on the growth and survival of white spruce. And so we have kind of this paired experiment with a thin stand and a non-thin stand. And we're gonna compare the different, um, the different growth and survival rates. And so all of these stands were thinned once at mid rotation. So somewhere between 26 and 46 years, which is pretty common for white spruce in the state. So what did that look like? Uh, well, here's some graphics. This is from, actually this is output from the forest vegetation simulator. Uh, and this is called the stand visualization system or SVS um, that looks at this. And so this is one example. We're going to kind of see what the forest looks like and then jump forward 10 years to see what it looks like. So this is one site in Itasca County, site index 69 feet, uh, and that's a base age of 50 years. Pretty common, maybe on the more productive side of a white spruce plantation. But here's what it looks like unthinned in 2002. Uh, you can see it's pretty crowded, lots of trees uh, growing here. But what happens when it's unthinned in 2012? So 10 years forward, you can see the yellow and brown here, all of these intermediate suppressed trees are starting to die. Uh, and so we're, all of that mortality is occurring um, after 10 years. And so here's a thin stand. So this is immediately after thinning. Right after thinning, we moved, moved about 50% of the basal area at age 25. So that would be common prescription, uh, nothing out of the ordinary for this kind of forest type. And now here's what it looks like thinned 10 years later in 2012. And so what you can see here is there's some mortality, but not nearly as much mortality as you see in the unthinned stand. And so the idea here is that if you do a commercial thinning, well, you might be able to utilize some of this product and leave some healthy trees behind. In this case, 
many of these trees have vigorous crowns. Uh, they seem to be doing pretty well, as we can see in the visualization here. And so thinning these stands 35 to 45 years is common. Uh, what we often uh, ask or, or recommend foresters to do is to thin to a basal area of 90 to 110 square feet per acre, or about 50% of the total basal area. And then to retain those trees with more than 40% live ground ratios. And so what we really found through this research is that maintaining a tree of about 40% live crown ratio is gonna be really good for spruce. It's gonna make a, a healthy, vigorous spruce tree in years to come. But thinning isn't always right for every situation and every white spruce stand. Uh, and so when not to thin is when budworm is already present. Uh, and so the idea is if budworm is already present, well, it's already done its damage to the growth and productivity of those trees. And also don't thin if other pest and decay problems are present. In this case, uh, other issues, other forest health problems uh, can just not lead to a good response in thinning. And that's especially why we don't recommend thinning in older stands. Uh, thinning stands that are 40, 50 years old, uh, you just don't get the response that you do when you thin younger stands. Uh, some mortality can be expected after thinning in spruce fir, uh, but most of the mortality happens in the smaller diameter trees. Uh, this is a paper that was done with the five-year results from this study. Uh, and you can see the diameter classes here on the X and the, the proportion of trees that died here. Uh, but if we look at those unthinned stands, most of those trees that died were in the younger or the smaller diameter classes. Whereas for the thin stands, some of the mortality that happened, and although it wasn't as much, uh, happened in some of the older or the um, more larger diameter classes. And so this goes to the idea that it's really those suppressed trees that can't survive budworm defoliation relative to those bigger trees. And so this is really why we recommend maintaining crown ratios of greater than 40%. That really ensures vigorous sustained productivity. And so this is what you're seeing here. Uh, these were the 10 year results after we thinned. Um, and you can see the thin stands really are still maintaining uh, if you look at the individual trees, almost uh, somewhere between um, about 0.45 and 0.5 uh, proportion of crown ratio, that's pretty good. Compare that to the unthin stand where we're getting much, we're getting below that 0.4 value. Um, we're not maintaining those healthy trees. Then if we look at the volume of the individual trees, uh, well, those thin stands, uh, we're seeing a lot more volume in those individual trees, more resources going to uh, those trees that are left after thinning uh, that continue to grow. And so volume is almost 50% more in the thin stands just 10 years after thinning. What we know, we took, uh, we did another measurement a few years ago on these white spruce trees and we're interested in when is white spruce growth the best? Uh, so what size tree? And so it turns out that uh, it looks like about white spruce between seven and nine inches in diameter um, is going to mean the best growth, but it depends on what the crown ratio is, and it depends on if that tree has been defoliated uh, with budworm. And so no doubt you can get in a thin stand with a high crown ratio and no defoliation, that's where you're going to be able to see the greatest growth. Um, in this case, this is the annual diameter growth uh, that you see here. If you have low crown ratio and non-thin stands, you're just not going to get as much diameter growth compared to high crown ratio in thin stands. So it's important to understand too uh, that we can model the diameter growth of these trees if we know something about the, the health of it and whether or not budworm is present. For those of you that are interested in more kind of the, the timber harvesting aspects of this, uh, white spruce is an interesting species because it's pretty shallow rooted, uh, which makes harvesting white spruce oftentimes difficult. And so it's really best to conduct any thinning operations that you might do on frozen ground with snow cover. Uh, and the idea there is that'll minimize the damage to roots. Uh, and so white spruce being sensitive to, uh, to harvesting, uh, doing all that you can to uh, be sensitive to that uh, is important. 
And then also to leave at least three feet or more between equipment and trees to prevent the root damage. Uh, and so this is really important if you're interested in, you know, how do we lay out a harvest? Where do the roads go? Uh, what kind of equipment am I going to have? Can I leave three feet in between uh, the equipment and the trees uh, to prevent that damage? So to summarize, uh, stands can be really responsive to thinning and potentially resistant to future spruce budworm activity. Um, we saw on the, when looking at the mortality that suppressed trees really can't survive the budworm defoliation, uh, whereas larger trees with more better crown ratios uh, can really maintain their vigor. And for white spruce, it's really that greater than 40% value. A crown ratio with more than 40% of its uh, of its uh, of its of its crown can really ensure a vigorous tree and really sustain productivity. So if budworm is is common. You can also think about promoting mixed species stands. Um, you might be thinking about decreasing the proportion of spruce and fir in the stand. The idea there it, it is if you have more spruce and fir, where you're likely to be more at risk to future budworm outbreaks. And so if you can promote mixed species, uh, you might be able to um, decrease the risk of budworm in the future. We um, have summarized much of this uh, in a little extension fact sheet uh, that you can find at this short link, um, z.umn.edu slash budworm. Uh, where we talk a little bit more about the life cycle of spruce budworm and how these uh, management treatments might fit in. Uh, and it's kind of uh, talks a little bit more about the history of the bottom room too, which is really fascinating uh, if you want to learn more about it. Otherwise, uh, that's all that I have. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. Uh, if you do have any questions, I'd love to chat more. Um, budworm is an interesting, uh, interesting forest pest, and uh, it's a lot of research that's gone into it, uh, and I'd love to chat about it. So best wishes with your classes, and I'll see you soon.